our speaker, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Economy. Over to you, Liz. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. Um, it's really a, a great pleasure to be here with you as always and to engage with the broader SOAS community. Um, and thank you just really for that very lovely uh, introduction. Uh, so I'm gonna talk, uh, as, as Steve mentioned, um, primarily on uh, China's foreign policy uh, ambitions, uh, its great power ambitions. Um, you know, this is a big year, 2022, uh, for China and for Xi Jinping in particular. Uh, there's the Olympics, uh, which I think Xi Jinping certainly hoped would be a second coming out party for China and for himself, uh, since he was in charge of the 2008 Beijing Olympics, uh, which were, I think, uh, in many respects, an enormous, considered an enormous success. Uh, he faces a daunting domestic agenda, including how to continue managing through COVID, uh, making progress on his common prosperity initiative, uh, addressing an, an overleveraged real estate sector, uh, and dealing with declining birth and marriage rates, uh, among other domestic challenges. Uh, and then, of course, there's also the 20th Party Congress, uh, where she will be likely reselected for his third term as General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, finally, um, there is Xi's international agenda. And again, that is what I'm going to uh, talk about today. Um, but I will say that to the extent that the domestic and the international agendas are related, um, you should feel free in the Q&A to ask me uh, questions about uh, China at home as, as well. Um, so five years ago, when Donald Trump was elected president of the United States, a narrative began to emerge fairly quickly uh, that China would replace the United States uh, as the world's leading global power. Uh, President Trump you know, very quickly began to unravel decades of US contributions to institution building and organizations and, and agreements like the Paris Climate Accord, the UN Human Rights Council, the Iran Nuclear Agreement, ultimately even uh, the World Health Organization. Uh, in the eyes of many international observers, I think China was the natural replacement. Um, it had the economic and military heft to lead uh, and Xi Jinping appeared ready and willing to assume the mantle. Uh, of global leadership. Uh, he'd already put in motion uh, new institutions like the Belt and Road Initiative and the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And he was delivering major international addresses on China's leadership, on climate change, and on globalization. At the time, I thought to myself, you know, I asked myself, I guess really, you know, could China uh, be the replacement? Um, and if it were, what kind of difference might it make uh, on the global stage? Um, so I decided to explore three questions. Uh, so first, you know, what are Xi Jinping's ambitions uh, for China on the global stage? Second, how is he pursuing them? And third, is he likely to succeed? Uh, I would say that in the United States, uh, while there is some consensus within the policymaking community uh, around these issues, there's not really consensus uh, among China analysts and scholars. All of these questions are still very much under debate in the broader foreign policy community. What my findings suggest, um, and I'll just give you a, a sort of a, a, a quick um, lead into my conclusions. Um, what my findings suggest is really that Xi's ambition um, is not to maintain or to uh, reform on the margins of the international system, but to transform it. Uh, so while many people argue, for example, that China has benefited from the current system for the past 40 years and thus has a stake in maintaining it, uh, I argue that China has changed dramatically over those same decades and believes that the world should change along with it uh, in ways that align with China's values and priorities. Uh, second, um, is that China's strategy is long-term, multi-level, and multi-domain. It marries strong state control with human and financial resources that are really unmatched by any other country. And it is able to persist and direct those resources in ways that other large democratic powers are not able to do so. And then third, will she succeed in realizing his ambitions? I will leave that to the end of my remarks. So first, let me say a few words about Xi's ambition for China on the global stage. Uh, I think it's captured uh, well in his notion of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation uh, and his effort to reclaim China's historic centrality on the global stage. Of course, at one level, China already occupies a position of centrality. It is the world's largest trading power and source of international lending. It boasts the world's largest population and military. 
It is a global center of innovation, and most analysts predict that China's real GDP will surpass that of the United States by 2030 or 2035. In addition, its actions on virtually any global issue from climate change to pandemics to proliferation are determinative uh, for the rest of the world. But Xi's notion of centrality is not simply about ensuring that China's voice is given the weight and influence within the existing international system that its relative power would indicate. It's not even about reforming the international system. I think instead his vision reflects a radical transformation of the international order and China's place within it. And I think this ambition manifests across five dimensions. First, she is trying to redraw the very map of China, the very geography of the Indo-Pacific by moving from staking Chinese claims around sovereignty to realizing them. For Xi Jinping, as he has said, there is no rejuvenation of the great Chinese, of the Chinese nation without unification. Uh, in the first instance, unification means Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the South China Sea. Beijing, as we've seen over the past year, has fully incorporated Hong Kong, of course, with the imposition of the 2020 national security law that effectively ended the city's political and economic autonomy under the one country, two system governance model that had been in place uh, since 1997 and was supposed to last until uh, 2047. Uh, Hong Kong is now just another Chinese city. China has also made progress in asserting its sovereignty in the South China Sea. Uh, it claims roughly 80% uh, of the area, but other nations such as Taiwan, Brunei, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Malaysia have conflicting claims. Uh, and China's claims are not recognized by international law. Um, but since Xi Jinping came to power, Beijing has created and militarized seven artificial features uh, in the South China Sea and laid claim to scores of others. Uh, and he's dramatically ratcheted up China's military assertiveness in the region uh, in an effort to intimidate other claimants and to assert dominance in the disputed waters. Uh, Taiwan is, I think, the biggest challenge uh, that Beijing confronts, um, and she has declared reunification with Taiwan as one of the 14 must-do items uh, for China to achieve its great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. I think since the election of Tsai Ing-wen in, in 2016 as the, as the president of Taiwan, uh, she has deployed significant political and economic coercion as well as uh, military threats against Taiwan. And I'm happy to talk more about Taiwan in the Q&A if people would like. Um, I think a lot of people assume um, that uh, these sovereignty issues um, are all that matter to Xi Jinping. Um, that these, this sort of narrow set of core interests, as they're often termed, are the only ones that matter to Xi. But if you look back to the first six to seven months of the pandemic, when other countries were distracted, uh, you saw that Xi Jinping also pressed China's territorial claims around other uh, areas. For example, uh, the Diaoyusenkaku Islands off of Japan or the uh, Paracels near Vietnam or uh, pushed uh, assertive uh, military um, actions in Malaysian and Indonesian waters and airspace. Uh, and of course, there was the first deadly conflict on the China-India border in 40 years. Uh, China also uh, even uh, reasserted a claim uh, in a territorial claim in Bhutan. Um, so I just, I, I put that out there because many people make the argument that we you know, really only need to be concerned about these core interests that China has expressed. But I think that if we, if we take a step back, we can see that Xi Jinping, uh, while those core interests are his top priority, that there is an entirely sort of a second tier of, of sovereignty um, interests and priorities uh, that he's also uh, pursuing, just not necessarily as aggressively as uh, that first uh, group. Um, although China's made definable progress, I think in realizing its sovereignty claims, its assertiveness has also provoked a strong reaction in the international community. Uh, European countries, um, as I'm sure those of you um, uh, in the UK recognize, have moved beyond uh, just economic in interests in the region to develop their own Indo-Pacific uh, security strategies. They've stepped up military support for freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. Uh, Japan and Australia have both indicated that Taiwan's security is tied to their own security. It's a major shift uh, in, in their policies. Um, and the European Parliament, as well as a number of, of, us, of European countries, are strengthening their economic and diplomatic ties with Taiwan. 
If you expand uh, out from this consideration of sovereignty, I think she's second objective is to become the dominant power in the Asia Pacific. Uh, she has repeatedly called for Asia to be governed by Asians, uh, has stressed their common historical, uh, cultural and economic ties, uh, and supported regional economic and security arrangements that don't include uh, the United States, uh, such as the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, China has also called for the dissolution of the U.S. security alliances, calling them anachronistic, a relic of the Cold War, and anti-China. Uh, and we've just seen, I should, I should mention, that China has bid to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which is the trade agreement that's been led by Japan that the United States um, had previously uh, pushed, but then uh, withdrew uh, from uh, at the end stage of the negotiations at the outset of the Trump administration. Um, but I would say China's success here in advancing itself as a, as a regional leader is mixed. I think Beijing has clearly cemented itself as the dominant economic player in the region, but uh, its military aggression has prompted you know, the establishment not of the dissolution of the US-led alliance system, but instead an entirely new US, UK, and Australia defense pact known as uh, AUKUS uh, that strengthens uh, this alliance system in the region. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize that public opinion polls throughout Asia indicate record low levels of trust in Xi Jinping uh, and desire for China to be the dominant power uh, in the region. The third dimension of Xi's strategy is to ensure that other countries' policies uh, and choices reflect Chinese values, uh, norms, and interests. Uh, and I think this includes a number of different Beijing directed efforts. Let me just tick off a couple. Most notable certainly is China's Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which Xi Jinping launched in 2013. Uh, it began, as I'm sure everyone is aware, uh, as uh, an effort to provide hard infrastructure connectivity, ports and railroads and highways, uh, connecting China through to the rest of Asia, Europe, the Middle East and Africa, uh, there were six uh, corridors initially, three overland uh, and three maritime. Um, but since its initial uh, conception, uh, it's morphed and evolved uh, to include a digital Silk Road. So that means fiber optic cables and e-commerce and satellite systems and China's exporting its uh, surveillance technology. Uh, there's now a Chinese uh, digital currency, the ECNY, um, that I think is going to uh, become very important uh, globally as well. Um, we've seen China uh, use to this kind of technology, this digital Silk Road also to uh, support its soft power uh, ambitions. Uh, for example, there is a 10,000 villages program in Africa uh, that uh, provides satellite TV uh, to, uh, to African communities. But in providing that satellite TV, it also provides programming content, uh, right? And not just, not just Xinhua, not just you know, the news um, and, and propaganda, but also uh, dubbed versions of, uh, you know, Chinese imperial dramas, uh, there's, and Kung Fu movies. Uh, there's a real effort uh, to use uh, this type of digital and technological outreach uh, to support uh, Chinese cultural uh, ambitions as well. Uh, in addition to the digital Silk Road, there's a health Silk Road that really uh, came to fruition uh, during the pandemic. And that's about exporting uh, sort of Chinese uh, medical devices, Chinese traditional medicine, offering uh, to build hospitals and uh, to send uh, medical support, particularly uh, during the uh, pandemic. Um, and there's of course a polar silk road uh, that is designed to connect China through to Europe uh, more directly and has involved um, not only a, a significant um, uh, increase in China's own uh, research and exploration capabilities uh, uh, on the Arctic, for example, uh, but also significant uh, investments in Arctic uh, countries. Um, I think the, the thing that's uh, interesting about the evolution of, of the Belt and Road is that in addition to uh, this sort of infrastructure, whether hard or digital or polar Silk Road or the um, uh, health Silk Road, there's also a political and um, uh, and security component to it. Uh, you know, China did establish its first military logistics space in Djibouti. I think clearly there are more to come. I think Cambodia will likely be uh, the next uh, uh, form of a, some form of a military base, um, Chinese military base that will appear. Again, this um, signifies a very significant shift from China's traditional position of never having overseas uh, bases. Um, and now you can find 
uh, a lot of writings uh, in China that talk about uh, the necessity of, of China having you know, many bases uh, globally in order to uh, protect uh, Chinese economic interests and also Chinese people who are uh, living and working uh, abroad. Um, and there's a, a political component as well. And I think this feeds into uh, what we heard come out of Xi Jinping in 2017 when he talked about exporting the Chinese model. He didn't say exporting, that's my term. I should say he talked about the China, uh, China's political development model uh, as one that was worthy of emulation. Uh, and I think the Belt and Road Initiative provides a vehicle uh, by which Xi Jinping is able to export elements of that model. Uh, and so you can look and see, for example, that um, within the Belt and Road framework, uh, China will provide cybersecurity training seminars. It will teach countries such as Tanzania, uh, you know, how to do real-time censorship of the internet. Uh, and you have countries like uh, Tanzania or Vietnam modeling uh, their uh, internet governance laws uh, after that of China. So this is not the wholesale export of China's uh, political model, but I think uh, through the Belt and Road, we do see China exporting elements of its model to willing and interested um, other countries. Uh, you know, is the Belt and Road successful? Um, I think the evidence of the success is, you know, certainly clear in the space of the past decade. You can see, for example, that China has gone from uh, providing 2% of, you know, the undersea fiber optic cables um, to, of the global, you know, market to now 18 or 20%. Um, so it's clear China's influence, its presence uh, has increased dramatically uh, since 2013 as a result of the Belt and Road. But I think as many analysts have reported, um, the Belt and Road has become increasingly bumpy. Um, uh, it is uh, essentially the wholesale export of China's development model. Countries get the benefits of rapid infrastructure-led uh, investment uh, and rapid economic development, but with all the same attendant externalities that China has experienced, namely corruption, rising levels of debt, environmental pollution and degradation, uh, labor issues. There are protests around Belt and Road projects in virtually every country. Um, the Chinese government itself has reported uh, that roughly 40% of Belt and Road projects are facing some kind of challenge with host countries. Uh, and as we've seen in the past year or two, especially with the pandemic, uh, many countries are now trying to renegotiate terms or even cancel projects. I also think within China, there is less enthusiasm uh, you know, for uh, Chinese investment overseas. And that's a popular concern, but also among some economists and even among uh, some uh, leaders in Chinese industry uh, who don't see necessarily an economic return uh, from their Belt and Road investments. And so we've seen a fairly steady decline overall in Chinese investment on an annual basis uh, since 2016. China's also tried to enhance its soft power through um, different initiatives, for example, like the Confucius Institutes, you know, whose primary objective is teaching Chinese language and sharing Chinese culture. I think for many schools and universities globally, uh, these uh, Confucius Institutes offer uh, an extraordinary opportunity to add Chinese language instruction to their curriculum. Uh, in many cases, uh, you know, at schools or universities that otherwise couldn't afford uh, to teach Chinese language. Um, and for a while, Confucius Institute proliferated rapidly. Um, but at the same time, the sort of coercive undertone uh, has begun to limit their attractiveness in many countries, especially in democracies. You know, university contracts with these Confucius Institutes were not transparent. So the Chinese government uh, demanded that they not, the contracts not be uh, publicized. So every university, you know, had to keep it secret and they kept it secret even from their own uh, faculty. Uh, and the teachers and the curriculum were determined uh, by Beijing. And that is a concession that most universities would never make uh, to outside partners. Um, so in the end, if you look, this initiative began, you know, before Xi Jinping came to power. But over the past decade, you know, China had planned to have a thousand Confucius Institutes by 2020. Um, but if you look, you'll see that they now have about 540 or so. So they've fallen far short of, of their uh, objective. And I think that has everything to do with, again, that sort of the coercive element of, of the Confucius Institutes um, uh, and the sort of uh, insistence by uh, China, by the Chinese government that they manage 
uh, you know, who teaches the curriculum and keep those uh, contracts um, secret. And then, of course, there were some uh, Confucius Institutes where actually uh, the, the heads of them uh, tried to uh, muck around in uh, other decisions or other politics of the university around, for example, you know, if the university tried to invite the Dalai Lama to speak or something like that. So there were some, some other issues, although those are really, you know, few and far uh, between. Of course, China also deploys more overtly coercive strategies to shape other countries' behavior. And we saw during COVID, um, its wolf warrior di diplomats you know, weaponized the personal protective equipment. Uh, they threatened to cut off supplies to countries that criticized China. Uh, when Australia called for an investigation into the origins of the virus, uh, Beijing initiated a widespread boycott of uh, some of Australia's most popular goods. You know, this type of behavior is actually not anything new. China has long used the leverage of its market to try to coerce actors to uh, align their positions with those of China. Uh, in the United States, you know, one of the most famous cases now um, has been uh, how Beijing responded to a tweet uh, in October 2019 uh, by the Houston Rockets general manager, Daryl Morey, um, so this is the NBA National Basketball Association um, in support of, of Hong Kong's democracy protest. Um, and you saw that stores pulled all of the Rockets branded uh, merchandise from their shelves. Um, China's central television, CCTV stopped broadcasting NBA games, Tencent stopped streaming them. Um, but I think what's really important about all of this, and it, it took a year before um, the games came uh, back on. Um, and interestingly, uh, Daryl Morey, after a year, um, that general manager uh, who, who posted the tweet, um, he left the Houston Rockets and went to the 76ers, and now um, 76ers games are not broadcast. So they followed, Shanks government followed Daryl Morey to his new team and is punishing um, his new team. But I think the broader point here is, is one that's made that was made by CT, CCTV at the time and actually didn't get uh, very much attention, but I think is, is quite important. And CCTV said, we believe that any remarks that challenge national sovereignty and social stability are not within the scope of freedom of speech. Um, and the reason that this is important, again, I think it goes back to that issue of sovereignty to some extent, and that idea that there is some set of, of narrowly banded issues that if you just don't talk about those issues. If you just don't poke at China on that particular set of issues, somehow you will avoid being punished. Um, but I think what CCTV indicated um, and what we've seen, you know, for example, in the case of Australia and COVID is that it's not simply about those sovereignty issues. It's not just about Taiwan or Hong Kong or the South China Sea, right? It can be about virtually anything because in the, Chinese mindset and the Chinese government mindset, almost anything uh, can challenge social stability. Uh, and I think what the CCTV remark indicated really was it was effectively signaling that any comment made anywhere on any platform, you know, including Twitter, which is not openly available uh, to Chinese citizens, that any citizen can, can expect to be uh, punished. Um, I think what's, what's important here too is that when you look at this type of, of coercive um, uh, effort that China makes to, using the leverage of its market, uh, what I found in my research is that while China often um, is successful in pressuring uh, industry and in pressuring multinationals uh, to, to change their positions on issues, whether you know, it's on Taiwan or whatever it might be on Hong Kong, um, it's not very successful when it comes to pressuring countries. And so when you look at when, when China launches boycotts against countries, and that holds true with Australia, but also with the Philippines, uh, you know, a decade ago, or South Korea around the fat defense system, these countries do not back down uh, from uh, China because of the economic uh, leverage that uh, China tries to, um, tries to exert. Um, the fourth priority for Xi's sort of great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, uh, his foreign policy ambition, um, is his effort to nationalize and insulate the Chinese economy within the context of remaining a superpower in a globalized economy. So in practical terms, this really translates into China reasserting state control over broad swaths of the Chinese economy through policies such as Made in China 2025, uh, which calls for Chinese companies to dominate in the manufacturing of components for 10 critical cutting edge areas of technology 
um, by 2025. So that includes things like AI, new materials, autonomous vehicles, um, uh, uh, medical devices. Um, and, then, and then this sort of larger policy that she just announced on dual circulation which basically argues that China can innovate, manufacture, and consume largely within itself while still selectively importing necessary capital and know-how and still being an exporting uh, powerhouse. Um, so I think that's, that's the experiment that Xi Jinping has underway right now in terms of China's engagement with the global economy. We're in the midst of it. Um, and so I think it's difficult to to know how it's going to turn out. But I think there are a couple of early takeaways. Um, first, in exerting greater state control over Chinese companies, I think Xi Jinping has made it difficult uh, for other countries to discern between what is public and what is private. Um, so that many Chinese companies, particularly in the tech space, face greater headwinds uh, in their efforts to go global. For example, Huawei. Uh, in addition, after the pandemic and China's weaponization of the personal protective equipment, countries are no longer comfortable with uh, China's control over significant parts of the global supply chain. So we now have efforts like the Quad Emerging uh, Critical Technology Group or the you know, US-EU Trade and Technology Council or this newly announced uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework that's coming out of the Biden administration, all of which have um, as at least one focus, reorienting uh, supply uh, chains uh, to ensure resiliency and redundancy uh, with the greatest sort of target of that effort, uh, of course, being China, because it has been so central to global supply chains in so many critical uh, areas. And then finally, um, you know, beginning in 2014, um, Xi Jinping has called for China to lead in the reform of the global governance system. Um, China believes that the current rules-based order uh, does not reflect um, uh, adequately its voice or the voice of uh, many other countries in the sort of emerging, uh, emerging economies. Um, and instead that this rules-based order was created and perpetuated uh, for the advantage of a small number of liberal market democracies. And so Xi Jinping wants the values and norms embedded in uh, international institutions to reflect Chinese preferences. And I, I don't think this is anything surprising. Um, it's particularly true in areas like human rights and internet governance, uh, economic development and technology uh, standards, and in domains where China uh, believes that the rules have yet to be fully established, um, such as the Arctic or maritime governments or space. So we've seen that China has been successful uh, in advancing its interests in international institutions, for example, in getting Chinese leaders elected to the top positions uh, within the United Nations. So uh, at one point, um, about two years ago, uh, Chinese officials uh, held four of the uh, top positions of the 15 major uh, UN agencies uh, and programs, far more than any other uh, country did. Um, I think the challenge that emerges, that we've seen emerge um, as China has played a, a, a larger and larger role uh, in international institutions um, is that Chinese officials are often tasked with uh, advancing narrower uh, Chinese interests, uh, uh, sometimes at the expense of broader uh, international interests that the institutions are supposed to serve. So on the one hand, Yes, China embedded, uh, successfully embedded Belt and Road Initiative in more than two dozen UN programs and agencies. So that just means that um, you know, various programs uh, support um, uh, the Belt and Road in some capacity. For example, um, uh, UNDP uh, might align its development projects with some development projects of, of, uh, of China. Um, there might be some money that comes for studies um, about how to work with China on the Belt and Road. Um, so there are a, a range of ways, or sometimes it could just be a memorandum of understanding. And all of this, I think, on the face of it is fairly innocuous. Um, but just to give you an example of how it can play out in a different way, uh, in 2019, Beijing threatened to block reauthorization of the UN mission to Afghanistan if the Belt and Road Initiative were not included in the language of the reauthorization. Um, we've seen Chinese officials um, in the International Civil Aviation Organization block people uh, who tweet in support of membership for Taiwan. 
Uh, and of course, there are uh, more egregious cases. So uh, as part of my research um, uh, for the book, I interviewed uh, Dolkin Issa, who's one of the world's leading uh, Uyghur activists. And he was physically prevented from speaking uh, before the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in 2017 after being invited. So he was invited, he was registered, he was supposed to, 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 to speak. He was physically prevented um, uh, by security guards. And the Chinese official who was then undersecretary for the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs at the time publicly claimed responsibility for blocking pieces of appearance on Chinese television. And he said, we have to strongly defend the motherland's interests. Um, I think, you know, here too, I think China's behavior has provoked a strong back reaction from other countries who now are increasingly coordinating their efforts to push back against China's, um, you know, subversion really of global governance institutions. So let me just finish um, by saying a couple of words about um, China's strategy and its relative um, success. As I suggested at the outset, China's strategy is long-term, it's multi-level and it's multi-domain. So if you take something like internet governance, for example, um, you see that China develops you know, the technology and the laws and the training to support its state-centered approach uh, for the internet at home then it exports all of these uh, components, the technology and the training uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative. And then it seeks to codify them uh, in global governance institutions. So to use international institutions like the United Nations uh, to propose something, for example, like new IP, which is basically a new way of, of uh, conducting internet governance that would enable governments to control uh, the connection uh, between to any one device to have basically to basically have an off switch uh, to any device in any country. Um, so that's a, a, a big new proposal that's come out of China. Again, it reflects its own domestic priorities, priorities that it's advanced through the Belt and Road Initiative and now seeks to cement uh, in international institutions. And this same strategy um, uh, holds true across multiple domains. So if you look at uh, what China's done in terms of traditional Chinese medicine, or, or its efforts to enhance its influence uh, in the Arctic Council, or, or to transform norms around uh, maritime governance, they all have this same pattern of a uh, high degree of focus on the home front, export uh, often through the Belt and Road Initiative, and uh, then looking for uh, sort of cementing alignment uh, in international institutions. Uh, and China, as has been said you know, many, many times, has a long-term vision. Uh, so you know, it's China Standards 2035 program, which it announced um, in 2019 or 2020. Um, you know, it has targets for the number of technology standards um, uh, that it wants to have, you know, Chinese technology standards that it wants to have adopted um, by international standard setting bodies. It has targets for the number of Chinese officials that it wants in these standard setting bodies. I mean, this is a 15 year strategy. Really don't see any other major country uh, operating in this way with this same degree of ability to mobilize domestic resources uh, and then uh, deploy them uh, at multiple levels. So will China succeed? Um, let me make uh, three final points. Um, first, I think uh, China's greatest strength um, is its model. There really is no other country that has the particular mix of interests, uh, of political capabilities, of human and financial resources, and long-term vision uh, that China does. Uh, second point, though, is that this model is also its greatest weakness. China at home is China abroad. Uh, the Belt and Road is uh, the export of the China model. Uh, as I mentioned, that debt-led infrastructure growth with all of those externalities. China's uh, efforts to uh, control the global narrative, right, around any issue that it deems threatening uh, to its sovereignty or its social stability reflects China's own domestic limits on freedom of speech. But the international community has much greater agency uh, than Chinese citizens and countries can choose how to respond uh, to this type of coercive pressure. Uh, and what we see is that countries, different countries respond differently to China's ambitions. You know, Asia Pacific countries are much more nervous about China's rapidly developing security ambitions uh, than those in Latin America. 
democracies are more concerned about things like Confucius Institutes or Chinese efforts to transform internet governance norms than authoritarian states. Um, citizens in many Belt and Road uh, countries are more worried about deeper Chinese engagement than officials in those same countries. Um, one interesting um, thing that I also discovered in my research is that you know, we tend to think of Belt and Road investment as correlating um, you know, pretty closely with uh, Chinese political influence, right? We've heard the stories about countries like Greece or Hungary refraining from uh, supporting uh, European Union um, uh, votes on you know, resolutions having to do with criticizing China, for example, for, for, its, for example, for its policies in Xinjiang. But what I found is that if you look, for example, at the top five countries uh, support for China in the United Nations on issues like the South China Sea or Xinjiang or Hong Kong, there really is no direct correlation between the amount of Belt and Road investment uh, and the level of, of uh, individual countries support for China's political positions uh, on these sensitive issues. And then the third point is that overall, I think if Xi Jinping continues down the current course, um, I think he's unlikely to realize his larger ambitions. The more aggressively that she attempts to enforce China's model in the context of the current international order, I think the more pushback that he encounters. You know, policies that are designed to enhance Chinese influence and soft power, such as the Belt and Road Initiative and Confucius Institutes, are having the opposite effect. Chinese assertiveness around Hong Kong, the South China Sea, the pandemic have contributed to bolster rather than to weaken uh, the US-led alliance system. Uh, and China's behavior in international institutions is now contributing to much greater attention to their actions and efforts. Um, and there are more efforts to build coalitions to ensure that China doesn't assume more leadership positions in the United Nations, doesn't take control of standards and st setting bodies. Fundamentally, I think in order for Xi's vision to succeed, he will have to modify it. Um, but I think it will be challenging for him to do that. Um, when I think back to this, uh, this past summer, um, and some of you may have seen uh, where he called on Chinese diplomats to present an image that is more credible and lovable and respectable, I think this represents the fundamental disconnect uh, in Xi Jinping's own understanding uh, that after a decade in power now, he's been in power since 2012, fall of 2012, China's image is not going to be created uh, by what Chinese officials say, uh, but by the reality on the ground. Um, and that seems to be something um, that Xi Jinping, uh, at least to date, uh, is not willing to moderate. So let me stop there and um, I will welcome uh, all of your, your questions and your comments. Um, Steve uh, told me ahead of uh, the talk that uh, he was going to give me the toughest questions. <laughs> so, so I'm really looking forward uh, to a, uh, a robust uh, discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Liz. That's an absolutely fantastic thought-provoking talk. I was going to ask you whether, whether Xi Jinping's policies would really was really good for China, but you actually kind of addressed that at the end. So I'll put it in a different way. We know China is committed to its rise, and Xi Jinping is taking a very different approach from his predecessor, Hu Jintao, who was talking a lot about the peaceful rise of China, trying to reassure the rest of the world. Now, China has changed in the last nine years under Xi Jinping's rule. Can China now turn back to the Hu Jintao approach of peaceful rise, reassuring the rest of the world that they don't have to worry about China, rather than following the wolf warrior approach that Xi Jinping is pushing? Can that be done politically? So, so the first the first tough question comes from from you, right? <laughs> so, I mean, can China turn back the clock? There's no turning back the clock per se, but could China modify its foreign policy approach uh, in ways that would resemble previous uh, sort of Chinese foreign policy um, conduct? It could. I mean, there's no reason that China couldn't take a step back, um, couldn't. Uh, you know, reconsider uh, its sort of military assertiveness in the South China Sea, uh, couldn't um, uh, take a step back from uh, its, you know, aggression, uh, greater aggression, uh, military aggression uh, toward Taiwan. 
um, you know, couldn't, uh, you know, think through, um, you know, a sort of a greater partnership uh, with the larger democracies um, uh, on, on a wide range of issues. Um, it, there's no reason to say that it couldn't, but I think that would, it would require a fairly fundamental shift uh, in, in also in the way that China's conducting its own domestic policies. And I think, again, because, you know, China at home is China abroad, you know, one thing to recognize, if you look toward that end period of the Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao era, and that peaceful rise period, you know, you had a much greater, you had much greater freedom on the internet. You had, you know, sort of much, you know, greater activity with, you know, non-governmental organizations. You had, you know, over 7,000 NGOs, foreign NGOs active in China. Today, there are, you know, roughly 400, right, since Xi Jinping passed this law in, in 2017. I mean, things have transformed domestically also in ways that, um, that reflect Xi Jinping's thinking about the nature of the Chinese polity and therefore the role that the Chinese polity is gonna play globally because what China does at home is going to be reflected in, in a multitude of ways in its behavior abroad. And so I think it will require not only just a shift, not only a shift in just foreign policy behavior, but it will actually require a degree of, of transformation in the way that the Chinese leadership is governing its own people, in the way that it manages its relationship with its own um, you know, companies, its technology companies. Um, so I think there's a broader shift that reflects how China views its engagement with the rest of the world and the rest of the world's influence inside China, right? Which Xi Jinping has been very concerned to control and to close off in ways that previous Chinese leaders have not as much. Um, that I think I think it's a it's a massive rehaul of both domestic and foreign policy that's required. I think anything short of that is, is just that same kind of, of language that you hear all the time from Chinese diplomats and from Xi Jinping himself that, you know, we just have to tell the Chinese story better. Right? Somehow this is all about our narrative. People just don't understand us and that's why they're worried. Again, that disconnect between what China's doing on the ground at home with regard to Xinjiang, with regard to Hong Kong, uh, and, and how that projects globally. There seems to be just this disconnect in understanding. Right. The first question I pick comes from Anastasia Marino de Paolo. She really enjoyed your talk and she was wondering about um, your point of China using international institutions for its own purposes. Does the United States not do it? Do they do it differently? Are they not the same? Or uh, they yeah, I mean, look, certainly um, uh, countries um, all seek to advance um, their interests, uh, both in their bilateral, uh, you know, policies and also as they engage in multilateral institutions. I think what is different um, to some extent in the Chinese case, and for example, I didn't mention some of the other ways in which um, China has, has sought to uh, advance its interests. Um, but for example, um, there are cases where um, as China has been soliciting votes for um, uh, its officials to become leaders of uh, various UN programs um, and agencies um, that in fact it has uh, either used economic inducements um, uh, to you know canceling the debt of one country or economic threats uh, for other countries uh, to to encourage those countries to vote for its candidates. Um, you don't find the United States uh, doing that kind of activity. You really don't find U.S. officials in leadership positions preventing um, uh, people from, uh, you know, tweeting things on, you know, uh, the, the websites of international institutions that just are run counter to U.S. interests. Um, there's not the same, I think, degree when, when Americans and other um, 
other countries' uh, officials go to serve within the United Nations as UN officials, there is not the same, there, there's an understanding that they are now serving those institutions, that they represent those institutions. They're not representing the United States. That's not to say our ambassador doesn't represent the United States or other things, but I don't believe, uh, frankly, that you find the United States and or many other countries behaving in the same way, in that same coercive way uh, that you find Chinese officials. I think Chinese officials are very much tasked uh, to use those positions, international institutions to advance Chinese interests. Okay, next question I think comes from a Chinese, uh, whose who's name sounds like a Chinese uh, national, uh, Chuanzhou Song. If China really wants global dominance, why don't China directly occupy as many as much land and colonize as many as many people as countries have done in the past two centuries? What must China do to relieve the West's concern that China is doing more than just protecting its own development? Yeah. So um, I think, let me, let me make clear something that I didn't actually make clear at the outset of my remarks, which is that um, while I think China is looking to reshape uh, the international system and the international order in ways that serve Chinese interests, I actually don't make the claim that China is willing, ready, and able to step into the shoes of the United States as the world's sort of sole superpower. Um, I don't see China, at least to date, as interested in bearing the burdens, for example, of global security or um, forging international agreements um, on, to address uh, various uh, global challenges. You know, China had that opportunity during the Trump years uh, again, when the United States was withdrawing very aggressively from many international institutions and, and arrangements to step up and play that kind of leadership role to, to do what a lot of people thought it would do, um, but it didn't. And so I don't make the claim actually that, that China seeks global dominance in the way that, and not that the US had ever had global dominance, but, but in the way that the US has been uh, for many decades, uh, you know, the dominant uh, global superpower. Um, but I do think that China um, is uh, a disruptive power uh, in its uh, assertion of its interests. And I think it's you know, disruptive militarily within the Asia Pacific. And that's clear. And if China wanted to, to reassure other countries of its benign intentions, it would stop. That would be an easy one, right? It would just take a step back uh, from Taiwan and from the South China Sea. That would be in the first instance what it could do. Um, I think, uh, you know, globally, um, there are probably sort of coercive elements to China's uh, behavior. Again, the wolf warrior diplomacy, it's threats to cut off PPE to countries that didn't thank it enough. It's economic boycott of Australia over COVID. I mean, all of these actions, um, I think are ones that have caused many countries that previously viewed China um, as a worthy partner, if not successor to the United States, or at least as a potential partner or successor, um, with much greater consternation. I mean, you know, honestly, what we've seen in terms of those record low global public opinion polls, it's not just Asia, it's globally, in terms of trust in Xi Jinping and in, in terms of, of desire for China to be a global leader, you know, those are all what we call, you know, in the United States own goals, right? These are things that China inflicted on itself um, by its behavior. And so I think um, it wouldn't be that difficult for China to, to reassure the rest of the world. Um, but I don't think um, that Xi Jinping is willing to sacrifice, right, China's ambitions uh, to assuage the fears of the rest of the world. I think he's willing to tolerate a significant amount of disequilibrium in the international system in a way for the short, in the way that he would view it for the short term to accomplish his longer term goals. 
right? So if you look at what happened with Hong Kong, you know, that process of basically, you know, suffocating all democracy out of Hong Kong, you know, really took no longer than six to nine months. It earned enormous, right, um, opprobrium from, from much of the rest of the international community that watched in horror, um, but it didn't matter, right? This is a priority for Xi Jinping, getting Hong Kong under control, you know, does it. And now he looks and thinks, so what's actually the punishment that I faced for this? Right, maybe nothing that significant. So I think that's to me that's the approach that that she takes. I don't think he's that interested, frankly, uh, in in worrying about what the rest of the international community is thinking about what China is doing as China is marching toward trying to achieve its objectives. Next question from Dominic Weld in London. It's very appreciative of your very thoughtful King's talk. If you are, if we are to engage effectively with China, what is the route to a successful, mutually beneficial relationship? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I think honestly, it's it's challenging right now. Um, uh, but I think it is it's a, a mixture of you know what many countries have called that kind of you know competition, confrontation, and cooperation. And I think that means, you know, pushing back um, against China where um, it threatens to undermine um, sort of the, um, you know, rules of the road that have kind of served to support um, uh, the international community over the past 70 years. Um, but it also does mean looking for those areas of cooperation um, and like climate change. Um, like maybe proliferation, although there are some issues around that right now. Um, you know, can we partner with China on infrastructure development, for example, right? So there's a lot of competition through um, the Build Back Better World initiative. You know, is there a way that we both compete and cooperate um, globally with China? Um, so I think, I think it will require a lot of, of energy and effort, uh, quite frankly, um, because I don't, I don't sense an enormous amount of interest, again, on the part of Xi Jinping for real partnership. Um, and, and so I think, but I think it's necessary. Uh, and I think it's also important to remember that there are many different views within China. And I think one of the challenges that's emerged over the past five to seven years has been that we've forgotten, um, or I, many people have forgotten how many different views and opinions and perspectives still exist in China. Uh, and that if we close off entirely, uh, or if we adopt an entirely competitive and confrontational approach, um, that we will be, uh, to some extent, closing off opportunities to engage with those in China that still want to have uh, a, a positive and, and outward engaging um, uh, relationship with much of the rest of the world. So I, I do think that's important to remember. It's harder to see now, but there are still many people um, who would wish for a, a China that was um, uh, still more in the peaceful rise, peaceful development mode of the Hu Jintao and Guan Zhebao era. Okay. Next question from Peter Humphrey. How much of China's strategic reach to global power is rooted solely in Xi Jinping's personal ambition? And if he were gone, would the behavior of Beijing change? So that's a great question, Peter. Um, you know, this is probably one of the biggest um, areas of debate, at least in the US um, China field. I don't know whether it's also true in the UK. I'd be interested, um, Steve, uh, to, to hear your perspective on this. But, um, you know, there was a really great book that came out um, by my friend Rush Doshi. Um, that makes the argument that um, basically China has been and will continue to be committed uh, to you know long-term strategic dominance, you know willingness uh, to have confrontation, um, and that the Xi vision is not really just the Xi vision; it's the vision that's always been there. It's just now you you have a moment when you actually have the capabilities aligned with uh, the the desires, right, with the interests. 
Um, so I'm of a mind that there um, is there has always been a thread of, of Xi Jinping um, that that but that Xi Jinping stands aside and that what we've seen in the past uh, almost decade since he came to power um, is markedly different from what came before and that he is largely responsible for that difference. Uh, I think he is the first Chinese leader to step up to the plate in the way that he did, you know, in his very first uh, set of remarks, call for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation and then proceed to define it by you know, strengthening the PLA, having a robust Chinese Communist Party at the forefront of the political system, you know, having economic targets. So really laying out a path toward achieving those objectives. Many of the ideas that Xi Jinping has brought to life existed prior to Xi Jinping, right? Even something like the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, builds off of, you know, Jiang Zemin's, you know, go out strategy. Um, it's, it's not that new. Right? I mean, the connectivity element of it, the branding element of it is new, uh, but it's not that new. And there, were, there was talk about it in the latter stages of, of the who in one era as well. So not, again, branded as the Belt and Road Initiative, but, but ideas about uh, promoting infrastructure connectivity. Um, but it took Xi Jinping right, to crystallize um, ideas and to transform them into actual policies and to push uh, things forward. I, I think, you know, the, the transformation at home into a much more repressive, you know, political system, polity, and a much greater ambition and foreign expansionism, I mean, bases, right? Again, a fundamental shift from everything that's come before in the PRC, um, I think, is Xi Jinping. So, could it be different with a different set of leaders? Do I personally believe that if Li Keqiang had become general secretary uh, and, and president of the country, we would be dealing with a different China? I do tend to believe that. But again, this is a source of much uh, debate uh, in the United States. But Steve, I just, if I can, I'd just be interested in your thoughts. Well, I will keep it very brief. I would agree with your last comments that I think if we had a different leader in China than Xi Jinping, um, we would be seeing a very different approach from the Chinese government. There are a lot of structural forces which would be in place anyway, but the way how China is conducting its relationship with the rest of the world at the moment reflect a lot of that approach and confidence Xi Jinping has in his own approach. So let's move on. Okay. And the next question comes from William Knight. He asks, what might be a likely scenario arising from the over-aggression of Xi Jinping? Um, so <laughs> Steve and I were talking about this a little bit earlier. Um, I mean, a, a scenario, um, I mean, I think we're seeing a scenario emerge right now. Um, in fact, in terms of the response of the international community um, to, uh, to Xi's overaggression, overreach, however you might want to, to put it. Um, I think if you look at what's going on with Taiwan, for example, you know, the Taiwan story is, is two stories. It's a story of Taiwan, which is, you know, a nation that, you know, is a very successful example of a democratic transition from an authoritarian state. Um, you know, done very well economically. Uh, it was a model of COVID response. Um, uh, so there's a lot of reasons why many countries now uh, have become more interested in Taiwan, right? So, you know, you have Lithuania, you've got France sending its senators, you've got, um, you know, people from the Czech Republic, officials from the Czech Republic uh, going to visit Taiwan. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, uh, Australia and uh, Japan, as I mentioned, um, indicating uh, that uh, Taiwan security is tied to their own. So, so there's, there's a lot of reason, you know, that Taiwan is attractive to other countries because of what Taiwan is. But Taiwan has also become such a significant focal point because of mainland Chinese aggression toward Taiwan, right? And so, um, you know, without that, you know, you wouldn't have Australia and uh, 
and Japan stepping up in the way that you have. I don't know, you know, whether you would have, for example, if it were not for Taiwan and the South China Sea, sort of China's military assertiveness in both those respects, you certainly wouldn't, I don't believe, have all these large European countries beginning to develop their own Indo-Pacific strategies that are focused on security issues, right? It wouldn't simply, used to be, Europe was just interested in, in um, Asia and China for economic reasons, for trade and investment. Um, that's been transformed. And I think it's been transformed largely because of Xi Jinping's own approach to, to the region, right? And his willingness um, to, to destabilize the region in many respects. Um, and a sense, I think, certainly from the United States, which has always been a, a major military power in the region, uh, but increasingly from other countries, uh, that what happens in Asia matters to the rest of the world and they need to become more engaged. So I think it, to some extent, we're already seeing a scenario play out where you're getting many more countries to, to rally around, to push back um, against China in ways that you would have anticipated uh, five or seven years ago. Um, and so I think that's to me is the most significant emergence of a scenario, a longer term scenario, would be if, if that pushback from the international community somehow translated into you know, domestic thinking within the Chinese leadership that they had moved too far, that they were pushing too hard and that there needed to be some kind of retrenchment in this assertive policy. And that might necessitate some pushback against Xi Jinping himself. That would be a longer term scenario. Since you mentioned Taiwan, there are a few people asking questions about Taiwan. Essentially, it's about will China use military force against Taiwan to take Taiwan? Uh, again, one of the big debates in the United States. Um, I tend to fall on the side that says that uh, when Xi Jinping believes that the Chinese military can successfully launch military action against Taiwan, um, if he doesn't see a path forward toward peaceful reunification, um, that it is more than likely that uh, China will launch military um, action against Taiwan. Um, and I think the reason that I say that is because he has so explicitly linked the success of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation to reunification with Taiwan. If, if he hadn't done that, and if he hadn't reiterated his willingness to use force, if you didn't see this narrative developing uh, in China, about how dangerous the separatist forces are in Taiwan. I mean, the separatist forces has been very quiet, actually. And, and Tsai Ing-wen has you know, indicated that she would like to have talks uh, with the mainland to resume the sort of um, subnational talks that were on, ongoing uh, prior to her election uh, that Beijing uh, stopped. So, um, so when, I, when I listen to the rhetoric coming out of Beijing, and when I look at the military actions, when you see videos being you know, developed and promoted, not only in China, but globally, you can watch them that simulate a mainland Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Um, I think we have to take all of that very seriously. Um, I, so, um, so I'm concerned. And I'll, I'll say the last thing is that, you know, in the many Zoom conversations that have occurred you know, between um, scholars uh, in China and, and outside China, which I've participated in, when I asked them, what is the path to peaceful reunification with Taiwan? I don't ever really get a very satisfactory answer. It's not clear to me that, um, that many people in the mainland see a, a path because there are so few people in Taiwan who actually advocate for unification with the mainland. So then what becomes that peaceful path, right? Uh, I, I don't know. So I am concerned about the possibility of, of military action. Thank you. Next question. Um, comes from Lithuania, Ellie Green. She would like to know whether you think the United States and the rest of the world will help Lithuania now that Lithuania is being punished by China for allowing Taiwan to open a Taiwan representative office? Uh, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> I think the answer is yes. I think um, certainly in the United States, um, there is um, significant 
admiration uh, for Lithuania's uh, willingness to stand up uh, for democratic principles, you know, being a very small, small country, um, and and sort of you know uh, taking the initiative in the way that it did. Um, so I think that there is interest, uh, certainly interest in thinking through ways, for example, that Lithuania could benefit through the Build Back Better World Initiative. Um, uh, yes, so the answer is yes, I do think. The international community, I know in the United States, is quite interested in finding ways to support Lithuania. Okay, next questions come from, I think, somebody who probably is a Chinese national, but who would like to stay anonymous. You talk about China's global power ambition, and then you focus mostly on uh, the East Asian region. The questioner would like to ask you about, what about MENA, the uh, Middle East and North Africa? Where does that stand in terms of China's priority? Is China being proactive or reactive in regions that are pr not primary in China's geographical reach? Um, so great question. I think um, uh, in terms of the Middle East or, or Africa, Latin America, um, broadly speaking, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative now extends to the entire world. Um, and, and again, China's interests initially were primarily economic. I think that's true in the Middle East, certainly. Uh, but I think gradually we see and will see more uh, interest, um, again, in possibly establishing some kind of military logistics space in a country in um, the Middle East. We've heard about that uh, as, a, as a possibility, um, certainly growing political influence. Um, we see uh, China stepping up in some respects at various points over the past few years to offer itself as a, as a negotiator, or like a peace negotiator. I don't think anything has actually come of these efforts, but it has stepped up in ways that are somewhat new. Um, to try to play a larger role. And Middle East is an especially interesting place in some respects because Russia has always been the dominant security actor in the Middle East, aside from the United States. China hasn't played that role. It's mostly been satisfied with um, its sort of trade and investment um, efforts. I think it's gonna be interesting to see whether you know, if China does in fact establish some kind of military logistics space, if it does become more uh, active in um, Middle East uh, security issues, um, whether or not uh, that in some respects challenges Russia's position or whether they find a way to, to work together to coordinate. Um, but, I, but I see um, China's role, you know, first and foremost in, in other areas outside of, of um, the Indo-Pacific as, um, you know, using the Belt and Road to embed Chinese economic and political and security interests. Um, and then I think Gradually, we'll see how those evolve. Um, but I think that is the role of the Belt and Road Initiative. Thank you. I'm aware that at least we have about two minutes or less. We would like to um, put to you this question from somebody in London who would like to stay anonymous. And the question is about where Hong Kong stands in China's re relations with the rest of the world. Does Hong Kong still matter? is the question. I think Hong Kong um, has become an incredibly important um, like touchstone for um, understanding the, the Xi era, right? She, not only Xi Jinping's ambitions, but, but the, the way that, that China does business. Um, I, I think it, it matters um, also when countries think about Taiwan. Um, because, you know, for any uh, country that believed that China could be trusted to maintain a one country, two systems governance framework. And, you know, I think for a lot of countries, they could sort of satisfy themselves, right, that this would be kind of good enough, maybe for Taiwan in some different form than what Hong Kong was experiencing, but still that could be. Um, I think there's no longer that trust, right? There's no longer that trust that, um, that China would maintain any kind of one country, two systems framework. And so that removes, I think, from many countries that kind of comfortable position that they could, they could, could occupy in their mind. So I think Hong Kong um, has really transformed 
thinking um, in, in many countries for many people um, about the nature of Xi's governance um, and what we should um, expect from China moving forward and how we should be thinking about Taiwan. Well, thank you very much, Liz, Dr. Economy. I'm afraid that the clock has defeated me and we have in the box over 50 questions. <laughs> so I must apologize to most of you whose questions I have not been able to put to Dr. Economy. Please be reassured that all the questions will be sent to her, including your comments. So she will note what you are interested in to engage with her in conversation. I do apologize that we, I have to draw this webinar to a close. Um, Dr. Economy has another engagement that she will have to go to now. With that, let me say goodbye. And I look forward to seeing some of you again at our event later this term. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, Steve. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Liz. It's really great. Oh, thanks, Steve. It's really fun. <laughs>